Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about preventing and addressing opioid misuse and opioid addiction, our nation's challenge. Joining us in our panel today are Dr. Jack Stein, Director of the Office of Science, Policy, and Communications, National Institute on Drug Abuse, Bethesda, Maryland. Dr. Renee Benzel, Regional Medical Director at Horizon Pharma, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. Kimberly Johnson, Director of the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. General Arthur Dean, Chairman and CEO at Community Anti-Drug Coalitions of America, Washington, D.C. Dr. Johnson, the media has recently been talking quite a bit about the heroin epidemic in this country. What is the extent of the problem and what is the major cause of the epidemic? Well, the epidemic really started back around 2000 with the abuse of prescription opiates. Um, like OxyContin or other medications that were for pain. And we've really seen an uptick in the heroin abuse, really mostly in the past five years. Um, and we think that it's related in some ways to people transferring from prescription drugs to heroin. The, the, the numbers of people who are abusing heroin are actually relatively small, but what we're seeing is, a, um, is growth in the use and particularly growth in um, overdose deaths, which is, um, has been growing quite alarmingly, and that's part of what's causing all the attention. Very good, thank you. And uh, General Dean, what do families need to understand uh, as they are looking at this challenge in terms of the potential risk of prescription opioids? Well, <clears throat> a couple things. First, I would say, um, that as we uh, talk about the media coverage before I talk specifically about the families, uh, the media coverage has been primarily focused on lo the loss of lives and how we might treat people and keep them from overdosing, which is very critical. But we also need to make sure that the media address this problem in a more holistic way. And what I mean by that is that it's important that we talk about prevention, intervening, and, and, and addressing the problem from the very beginning and following it all the way through to the end. And uh, I'm concerned that the media has not been doing that. Families uh, need to be very concerned about this because the problems associated with uh, the abuse of opioids and medicines, it not only impacts the individual, but it impacts the family, it impacts the entire community. And, uh, and we need to, have, we need to be, have open conversations about it. We need to put in place safeguards within our homes to make sure that the medicines that we have been given for legitimate purposes uh, are not being abused. So it's important that uh, the family and the community understand this issue, embrace it, and talk openly about it. And Dr. Stein, talk to us about what is the non-medical use or misuse of prescription opioids? Yes, well that's uh, clearly been one of the major problems here and been driving a lot of the uh, overdose uh, epidemic that we do here have in this, in this country. Um, it's really astounding when you look at the number of prescriptions that have actually been written for pain management in this country. One, we need to recognize that pain management is a legitimate and important component of our healthcare delivery system. At the same time, we need to take a look at good pre uh, prescribing practices. Over 200 million prescriptions for pain management were issued back in 2014. That translates to several billion tablets or tabs or, or pills. The question, of course, is uh, are they all being used for legitimate pain uh, or, in fact, is it being diverted? And unfortunately, the reality is much of it has been diverted. In fact, if you look at the data, if you look at the statistics, a majority of people who are accessing prescription medications for non-medical use are actually getting them from family or friends or other sources, some of course uh, from uh, their own physician, but it's being diverted and it's because it's available. And uh, 
Uh, General Dean is absolutely correct. We have so many opportunities to intervene early and really prevent so much of what is happening down the line in terms of the level of addiction and problems that we're seeing. Very good. And um, uh, Dr. Bensell, the more than one person on the panel has talked about the prescribing of, of these medications. What do individuals who are, are prescribed these medications need to be aware of? What, what should they be uh, on the lookout for? Um, well, I think that um, there are other pharmacologic means and non-pharmacologic means for managing pain. So you don't necessarily need to be prescribed an opiate, which in the past has been very loose, um, as well as, you know, who should get it, um, not really stratifying patients correctly, but also um, giving more than is necessary for the pain generator. So I think um, we should be vigilant in asking, um, do we need an opiate, either for ourselves or for our children? Um, and then um, secondly, only giving a limited quantity to get you through that severe pain episode. That's very true. You know, sometimes I'm, I'm prescribed, and not only uh, uh, analgesic medication, but other medication, and they overprescribe. I mean, you're, you're left with almost three quarters of, of, of the prescription in, in the home. So we, can yes, I just absolutely. add to that? Because I think a lot of us, you know, we have a cupboard full of old medications that we hang on to just in case we might need them later on. I think people also, in general, are pretty free about sharing their medication, you know, so so a friend has something, symptoms that sound kind of like yours and, and people say, oh, I have this thing, would you like to try it and see how it works? And so I think we need to be very aware of, um, of the, the environment that that creates when we are, when we have loads of medicine we're just hanging on to just in case and when we're sort of freely sharing medication that was prescribed. Very true. Jack, um, Dr. Stein, we uh, at, at uh, CSAT, you know, have been going around to various universities and, and colleges and talking to them about prescription misuse. And I was alarmed, certainly, uh, to learn that a lot of the medications that the collegiate level um, young adults get a hold of are prescribed by their health units. If they go in and they say, well, I've got a toothache and you know, I can't get to my dentist, and, and some of them said, well, you know, they'll prescribe oxycodone for, for, the, for, for, for this malady, you know. So do, do parents need to be aware, and, and who talks to, to these youth and young adults, you know, to warn them? Yeah, absolutely. And I like calling you, me, calling me Jack, so Yvette, <laughs> um, we can go on a first name basis. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't think an issue to this level has ever um, uh, caused us to stop, pause, and take a close look at how, in fact, medicine is delivered in this country. And so in medical schools and in college health units and prescribers all over the country, we're all stopping and pausing and taking a close look at how, in fact, uh, medicine should be administered. And we're very fortunate, and I know we'll be talking about this more today, about the CDC has recently issued some guidelines around how to treat um, for chronic pain. And uh, leading up to those recommendations was a, a much better understanding in terms of what we do know and what we don't know about uh, how pain should be managed and the role that opioids can and don't have to play in that. So I think it's giving us a pause to, to step back in terms of prescribing practices in general, and but families uh, uh, play a key role in that, particularly when they're dealing with minors, because uh, a parent has that responsibility to ask those questions. General Dean, mm -hmm. I saw you writing something down. Did you want to mm -hmm. add to that? Well, I was just going to just say, and, and, and we'll probably get to it a little later, but I think it's important to say it now. And one of the reasons why we have worked so hard to ensure that all states have a prescription drug monitoring program and that they have active programs, meaning that the physicians have to provide the data into those programs so that people cannot do doctor shopping and, uh, and not get medicines that they do not deserve to have. Uh, I went on a, a ride along with the uh, police down in the state of Florida 
and saw people going into what was quote unquote called pain mills, getting all these prescriptions that uh, they rightfully should not have had. So, so, and and we have only one state in the U.S. now hasn't that does not have one. That's the state of Missouri, and everyone's been working and pushing Missouri to make sure that they have one. I think, that, and those kinds of programs are critical uh, for us to have to make sure that we, because as uh, Dr. Stein said, availability drives use. And if we can manage and control availability, we can drive down use. Do your coalitions get involved in, in, in calling for these measures within the state? Absolutely. They, uh, they inform their state leaders. They inform their elected officials. Uh, this is something that is very critical and important to them. Uh, and they also have been doing a lot of work with uh, law enforcement on, on making sure that they have appropriate dispensaries well, I should say boxes where they can turn the medicines in and working with the Drug Enforcement Administration on take back issues. So, so yes, they are actively involved in this. So Dr. Johnson, can you explain a little bit what opioid use disorder is? So an opioid use disorder is when someone, there are actually 11 symptoms of opioid use disorder. Um, so when someone meets the diagnostic criteria for having a minimum of two of those 11 symptoms. And the symptoms are things like feeling, having cravings, um, um, having physical withdrawal, um, or also things like getting into trouble because of your seeking or your using of the opioid use Very good. drugs. Well, when we come back, we are going to talk about how we then manage the addiction issues related to opioid misuse and opioid addiction. We'll be right back. Opioid misuse is a rising epidemic that is having devastating consequences for individuals, families, and communities across the nation. It is truly a matter of life or death. Addiction to prescription painkillers and powerful illegal opioids like heroin and illicit fentanyl is skyrocketing. In 2014, an estimated 4.3 million people aged 12 or older had misused pain relievers during the past month, and an estimated 1.9 million people aged 12 or older had an opioid use disorder. The number of heroin users has doubled since 2007. In 2014, an estimated 914,000 people aged 12 or older had used heroin in the past year. The human costs are staggering. People are losing their jobs, homes, families, and their lives. Every day, 44 people in the United States die from prescription drug overdose. Not enough people are getting treatment for opioid addiction. Only two out of 10 people with an opioid use disorder get the treatment they need. SAMHSA is playing a lead role in carrying out the HHS initiative to reduce opioid overdose deaths by focusing on three high-impact areas. One, improving prescribing practices. Two, increasing access to the overdose reversal drug naloxone. And three, expanding the use of medication-assisted treatment. Agencies across the federal government are working together and with partners in communities across the country to confront opioid misuse from every angle. We're educating the public on the risks of prescription drug misuse. We're expanding community-based efforts to prevent drug use, and we're pursuing smart-on-crime and coordinated approaches to drug enforcement, including heroin trafficking. My son, Aaron, was 20 years old, and in October of 2013, he overdosed on heroin. Something made me decide that I wanted to tell the story, that that was part of the challenge for me, was that denial and our inability as a family to acknowledge the real problem that existed for Aaron and the danger I did not know, I did not know really that opioids can come with such an instant death sentence. I remember hearing on the news about prescription medicine, prescription pain pills, that kids were using it and it was harming them. I remember thinking, that's not me. I remember thinking, oh, it's 
prescription pills, they're not dangerous. When you take prescription opiates, you might not think you can overdose, and you might not, but the odds are that you're gonna start using other stronger opiates or even heroin, and with the stronger opiates, there's definitely a chance of overdose. This is a societal problem that we have to address and we have to face. Uh, pretending it doesn't exist is not gonna make it go away. It's gonna allow it to get even worse. Uh, and that's an area where uh, Overdose Lifeline has a great deal of expertise. Overdose Lifeline is a nonprofit based in Indiana. Primarily we work out of Indianapolis, but we do cover the whole state. And our mission really is about um, stigma and addiction and providing resources to families and loved ones of individuals. This is not about drugs as a prevention education program was piloted just a year ago in five schools in the Marion County, Indianapolis area. We were able to reach about 1900 kids, all very good results. And through May of this year, 2016, we've reached about 9200 students in middle school and high school in the state of Indiana. Any community that has a need, which is pretty much across our nation, I want them to know that there's a program that can reach our youth and clearly explain to them the risk of opioids and help prevent that first use to stop the number of people that are facing addiction or the reality of overdose. My family and friends are always with me, no matter where I may be. Sharing stories from home helps me sustain my recovery from my mental and substance use disorder. Join the voices for recovery. Our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. Dr. Johnson, there are many efforts throughout government uh, related to this epidemic, and I, I would like for you to address what SAMHSA is doing related to it. Well, we're doing a number of things, um, both on the treatment and prevention side. So I'll start with prevention. Um, and, and our prevention work, um, while we are working with the communities and trying to do primary prevention, um, early identification, one of the primary new efforts in prevention is preventing overdose death. And so we have a number of grants and opportunities to help um, communities get access to um, naloxone or Narcan, um, to, which is an, an antidote to overdose. So that's one activity that's a relatively new activity that we're engaged in. We are also, we have some grant programs around increasing access to treatment. And we have, um, we are, we have some training programs and some efforts to try to get more physicians um, who are, we call it wavered, who are able to prescribe buprenorphine um, and who have more education about addiction in general so that they can treat addiction. So, so multi, multiple um, efforts on multiple levels to try and address this issue from a prevention and a treatment perspective. Very good. And Jack, I'm sure NIDA is also part of uh, uh, the effort to address this issue within the department. Uh. We are. We work very closely with SAMHSA and other federal partners. And NIDA, of course, is the, uh, uh, the research arm of the Department of Health and Human Services with respect to drug addiction issues. And there's some really exciting things that have been happening. One in particular has been the advent of a, uh, a nasal formulation of naloxone, the antidote that we just talked about. Uh, so that's very exciting in terms of access and ease of use. And then we're in the throes of working on some new medications that actually will have uh, less abuse potential uh, so that in fact uh, down the line uh, opioids for example may not be actually necessary as a means of uh, treating pain because there are new uh, approaches to that. That's down the line but that's some of the exciting research that's really underway currently at NIDA. Very good. Uh, Dr. Benzel, the uh, efforts within the pharmaceutical industry is also uh, alive and well. Are they, are they moving to uh, address this issue in a, in a very uh, direct way? Well, I think that they have been 
trying to adjust or change the formulation of medications to make them more abuse deterrent. And while we can't really call them abuse deterrent, um, they are more difficult to um, manipulate in order to get the drug rapidly, which is what um, one wants when typically they're um, addicted. But also they've tried to implement REMS programs, which is where they're monitoring the use and prescribing of the drugs. But I think in general, what I've seen, um, in my opinion, is that as drugs become more difficult to get certain opiates, then the user switches to, for example, short-acting opiates. Now that OxyContin has been reformulated, they're now switching to more concentrated short-acting oxycodone. So there's still a lot to be done and developed when it comes to pharma as well as the FDA's input in terms of drug approval because they still seem to be approving drugs, um, I would think, much more rapidly. Um, given the epidemic that we have going on. Are they working with physicians at all to also inform them, better inform them in terms I mean, of I prescribing? I would assume so, but I, you know, again, in my opinion, this has been almost a doctor-driven epidemic. I think that physicians are not schooled in pain management. In fact, veterinary students get five times as many education hours than medical students do. So it really starts from the time that one is being educated in med schools, but with all those that are already practicing, there's still, again, no mandatory um, education that's required, and anyone can prescribe, whether it's a dentist, an ER doc, primary care, nurse practitioner, if they have a DEA license. So there's still a lot of looseness within the system, I Very think. Good. General Dean, talk to us about what the community coalitions are doing, if anything, related to, I'm sure you're getting calls from, from parents and from uh, other community activists. Yeah, we, we have been, uh, the coalitions have been actively involved in this for a generation now and very, very concerned about it. Uh, but what we've been trying to do at CATCA, uh, Community Anti-Drug Coalition of America, is number one, to make sure that Congress and our senior federal officials understand the problem and are funding the problem and making programs available. Uh, and one of the things that we got them to do going back several years to pass something called the Drug-Free Communities Program, which allows community coalitions to get a small grant to do their work. And these coalitions are effective in doing that, and they are addressing this issue. As a matter of fact, they have about four areas they can address. Illicit drugs, obviously, um, underage drinking, uh, tobacco, and they now can address Rx as well. And, uh, and what they're finding is that when you can take the science that we get from NIDA, the strategies we get from SAMHSA and other agencies, and, and implement them at the local level across multiple strategies, you can in fact push back. So coalitions are actively doing that and seeing results and have evaluations to, uh, to prove that. Very good. And um, Dr. Stein, in terms of getting the, the, the public to really adopt the use of some of these, uh, and you come from a policy background, mm -hmm. what has happened uh, in order to facilitate that process? I think it's change for the positive, but we've got a long way to go. How as, so? uh, well, as Dr. Johnson knows very well, uh, we have many treatment programs throughout the country and many physicians that are able to prescribe these medications. We need to increase the numbers, and I know that's the work that we're doing uh, collaborative, collaboratively to, to ensure. I think in addition, what we need to do on the research side is to keep on building up that clinical arsenal. Three medications is great, but uh, people vary and people have different needs and uh, different types of medications may be good for different types of individuals. So we need to keep on building up what available medications that we have. Um, as one quick example, um, right now awaiting hopefully FDA approval is a form of buprenorphine that actually can be implanted under the skin and be uh, effective for up to six months. 
So can you imagine the opportunities that that arises for individuals that may have difficulty, like all of us probably have difficulty, remembering to do the same thing on a daily basis? So I think that's just one example of how we can actually enhance some of our existing arsenal, but also build additional ones. May I add Absolutely. <clears throat> and also what we've been able to do with our coalitions, we had people like Dr. Stein and others come to our training events and talk about medicated assisted treatment. And then these coalitions are all across the U.S. are going back out in their communities and educating their community leaders of the importance of using medications in relationship with other types of activities to solve the problem. So the coalitions uh, are working with judges, working with district attorneys, working with other s leaders in the community to help improve their knowledge and understanding and appreciation of medicated assistant treatment. Well, I, and I think that's critical, General Dean, because um, part of the issue is that these medications have to get to the hands of first responders, have to get to the hands of even families. Correct. You know, because a lot of times people say, well, you know, my child absolutely wouldn't do that. Well, our parents are finding out that Johnny and Mary, yes, indeed, can, can be engaged in in abusing uh, these drugs. So I think that's a, a, a great deal of um, advancement, I think, uh, on that front. Yeah. And when we come back, I'm gonna let Dr. Stein say what he needs to say. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> The most effective treatments for opioid use disorders are medications, and there are three options. The first is naltrexone, which sounds like naloxone, and some people get them mixed up, but naloxone is an antidote to overdose, and naltrexone is a treatment for alcohol use disorders and opioid use disorders. The second is buprenorphine. Both of those can be prescribed by your physician. And the third is methadone, and methadone is offered only in specialty clinics, but there are specialty clinics in most, available in most states. In addition to having medication, most people need counseling as well as potentially other kinds of recovery supports to help them achieve a full recovery. And some people actually can get better without the medications and, and having only counseling and recovery supports. And recovery supports are things like help with, um, help with finding a good meeting to go to, help with housing, help with um, developing new, a new social um, environment where you have friends who aren't using. So there are all kinds of things that recovery supports can offer. Um, in addition to the sort of traditional counseling and medication. And, and the, a good treatment program will help a patient make a decision about what the best treatment, um, treatments, treatments, I guess, are for them. So me, it may include medication, it may include counseling, it may include various different kinds of recovery support services, depending on what the person's particular needs are. SAMHSA is expanding access to medication-assisted treatment in a number of different ways. We have specific grants for states to help them develop infrastructure and to provide medication. Um, we, so that's, that's our big new effort to uh, expand access to medication. We're also working on training physicians and physician extenders like nurses and, uh, and physician assistants on on using medications and treating substance use disorders and developing skills to screen so they can identify and to prescribe medication so that they can provide the medication part of treating substance use disorders. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Welcome back. Dr. Stein, uh, do you want to contribute what you wanted, what we left off in the, in the last panel? Sure. Our last discussion m prompted me to realize the importance that we are, still have a lot of work to do around conveying to family members, society at large, and certainly of uh, clinicians are that um, the nature of addiction and addiction as a health problem, as a disease, 
because different, there are still different views on that for many people, and it influences how practice is actually delivered in terms of the use of medications and behavioral therapies and other types of interventions. So it just struck me that as we're talking about in what we need to still do, uh, we have a lot of work to do even just in helping um, the society understand what addiction really is. And have you, has NIDA, for example, uh, generated any kind of approaches in doing so? Oh, I think so, and I think we have to work very closely with colleagues in other federal agencies like SAMHSA, and certainly, uh, to me, the, the rubber hits the road with, uh, with, with community and community coalitions, and that's why partnerships with different stakeholder groups, particularly CATCA, makes it just so essential to help take some uh, important research-based concepts, such as why addiction is a disease, and uh, help translate it so that uh, people appreciate it, understand it, have an opportunity to talk about it. I think it really just shifts how we approach policy and practice. Following up on the whole issue of physicians, I know that CDC, Dr. Johnson, just issued some guidelines on uh, the, prescription, the prescribing of opioids for chronic pain. Can you describe pretty much what those contain? Yeah, they, the guidelines from the CDC basically um, describe opioids for, as sort of the last line of defense against for the treatment of pain. So they have recommendations about other kinds of um, pain management activities and, and to help physicians think about um, pain management as opposed to necessarily pain treatment and to think about how, um, how best to prescribe opioids. So it really changes the way that, um, or it's designed to change the way that physicians think about how they treat pain. And has SAMHSA also issued other guidelines? I know I remember seeing a pocket guide. Our pocket guides. We have pocket guides for physicians, um, particularly for treating um, addiction both with medications, um, both for um, treating alcoholism and opioid use, uh, opioid use disorders. Very good. And those are available at the SAMHSA, the SAMHSA uh, store. Store, absolutely. <laughs> Doc, Dr. Bensell, uh, in terms of, um, we were talking before about educating the, the physicians and, and, and getting them to un better understand, uh, but let's talk about also the need for the consumer to also be educated. What does the consumer need to know as they're prescribed these medications? Um, I. Well, if, as a parent, I think we need to question the prescription that we're getting for our children to be aware that for some people it just takes using uh, an opiate one, two, three, four times before they become addicted because addiction is a disease. It's not a choice for many people. Um, I also um, think that the patient themselves needs to also be aware of of the, the harm that it can do because for many people it really doesn't work to treat pain, many times chronic pain even, which is how a lot of the epidemic even started, was trying to treat non-malignant pain. But there, again, there's alternatives to using opiates, so I think we all need to be well educated. And I just want to make one comment too because I keep hearing misuse and addiction. Some people are prescribed opiates and, are, and take them exactly how they're prescribed and it was incorrect by the physician prescribing or the um, person writing the prescription. So some people use opioids and get addicted by using them the way they were intended. So it's not always misuse. It's people that get a prescription, become habit formed, and then the rest is So history. it goes to my point that we have to be uh, very uh, acutely aware uh, when we prescribe opioid-based medication to ask the questions mm -hmm. and to be our own uh, sort of advocate for our own health. Correct. Correct? General <laughs> Dean? It is true. But this is such a big problem that I guess it's been a couple years now that CATCA, um, in, in, with working with Mary Bono, who was in Congress, you know, and championed this issue and was very concerned about it. So it was CATCA, Mary Bono, and Trust for America's Health. So we came together about two years ago and created a collaborative. And the purpose of that collaborative was to address effective prescribing policies around opioids. And we now have reached out to nearly 70 different 
uh, different organizations that represents uh, individual family members, the, the manufacturers of these medicines, the distributors of these medicines, the physicians, pharmacists, all trying to forge national guidelines and policies to help shape this issue. So it is something that requires a great deal of work by everybody, uh, and, uh, and, and everyone is working at it very diligently. Can I just go Certainly. to your question, your question about um, people who get prescriptions? I mean, I think one of the things that happens a lot is, um, so not for chronic pain, but for something acute, you get your wisdom teeth out, for example, right? You may need a medication for a day or two, but it's really a habit of prescribers to write a 30-day prescription, right? So that... So when we think about tablets. yeah, thirty right. So it's I mean it's just it's just so they it's a habit. That's kind of the way they do it. And so so people need to know it's not like taking antibiotics, right? It's not like you have to use the whole prescription. Um, and so that I think people just have to be very conscious of um, what they're getting prescribed and what it's for, and ask questions of their of their provider, of their physician, or their other prescriber about what the needs really are. You know, um, Dr. Stein, it, it augurs almost for um, an ongoing assessment of policy uh, related to how we're doing all these uh, uh, different systems, uh, how, we're, how we're approaching this issue. And, and to the best of your knowledge, what has been the most effective uh, approach to, to date and, and what do communities really need to be aware of because uh, General Dean certainly talked about the coalition work and about writing to the physicians and about getting to the parents and still you see so many people that are uninformed and, and, and as they walk into their child's room and they, and they find them in a comatose state or, or you know in, in a position where they can't help them any longer I mean I, Help me out. Help sure, me understand it's, uh, this. Um, it, it's not an easy solution, but it, the, the answer is somewhat easy. And uh, General Dean had actually mentioned it earlier on in today's show, and that's a comprehensive approach. So, um, and I think uh, the positive side of all of this is that, particularly with the prescription drug problem that we are experiencing, it can be managed because we understand the source, we understand the, some of the intervention points in terms of better prescribing practices, uh, uh, prescription drug monitoring programs. So there are very specific things that have actually begun to be put into place and can continue to do so to really uh, 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 address this problem. Um, one of the things we didn't talk about today yet, which I think is all interrelated here, it's connected to the CDC guidelines and connected to a great project that, uh, that CATCA is doing right now, building on both NIDA and SAMHSA work, and that is in the importance of screening. And uh, screening, brief intervention, referral to treatment. Uh, we often call it SBIRT, but uh, it's embedded in really the CDC guidelines is the importance of every physician, every clinician uh, doing an assessment of what's going on with their patient. And uh, it's such an easy, but it does take time to do, but it can be very doable to really get a better sense of what is the nature of the problem here and is there uh, uh, and a, a, a need to, to, to do some type of an intervention, whether it's a brief one or a referral to more uh, comprehensive treatment. And, and I, would, I would add that uh, I agree with everything that's been said, but I do want to, to, to raise a, a different issue, but a very important issue, and that is that there are individuals out there that are abusing these opioids and other medicines that w are not patients that they, they simply want to experience the high of drugs. And therefore, they are even taking them out of medicine cabinets. Um, real estate agents now are saying, if you are selling a home, for example, don't leave any medicines in your home because people will come to an open house just to rob your medicine cabinets. So, so we have to understand that, yes, it's important, to, talk, uh, to work on the issues that we all have been talking about. How can we help doctors better prescribe? How can we better manage pain? But we also need to understand that there's an element in our society that are intentionally misusing these opioids just to get a high. And we've got to work on that. We've got to change attitudes in the community 
to prevent that as well. That's absolutely true. And when we come back, we will continue to talk about approaches to address this issue. We'll be right back. So I had experimented with heroin once, and I liked the feeling. And I real I remembered that, and I was so not myself. I felt like I just want to feel normal. And being foolish, I picked up, and it gave me a. I was in a state of euphoria. I felt I was relaxed. I was comfortable. I felt like I could just function. And little did I know that it was just recreation for all of two days. And after that, it was a need for it. So I was physically sick for a long time. I could not, it was hard to function. I had to because I had to go to work, take care of my baby. And it just spiraled down to losing everything. I go to mutual support groups and I I volunteer in the neighborhood, you know, where they donate food, clothing, and I, anybody that needs help, I make sure I refer them to the proper facilities if I can. I've been in recovery for 20 years, and my life is so much better. I have quality, a quality life. I have balance. I have the self-respect, my self-respect trust and respect of my family and my friends. I've overdosed many times. Um, one time I overdosed at my parents' house upstairs in my room by myself and but the grace of God, my mom came upstairs and she found me and she was able to administer naloxone to me. Opiates are not a drug that you sample or try or experiment with. They can be addictive and even fatal on the very first dose. Naloxone is the overdose reversal drug and primarily it exists for that purpose and that purpose only. It's a short term and immediate fix to save lives. Overdose Lifeline was the first organization, private organization in the state to be able to distribute naloxone to the lay public. Which means we can carry naloxone and distribute it to families and caregivers. We just tried as much as possible to remove the barriers of asking for help. We do training sessions and we have everyone do a hands-on demonstration. So naloxone in the home is not about enabling the use. It's about changing the conversation and removing that shame and stigma and allowing for, for recovery. Changing the language, removing the stigma, provides people with hope that someone cares enough to help them walk this journey. Because it's a difficult, scary journey and there aren't a lot of resources in the same fashion as there are for other chronic diseases. If you're lost in addiction, there is a way out. I used to think the only way out was to die, but there actually is a way out. There's recovery. Opioid addiction is not the same as alcohol. It's just not. It's the same in that it's a chronic brain disease, but it's not the same in the way treatment needs to be approached. So I really want Overdose Lifeline to be able to find what those best practice models are and be able to rec replicate them in the state of Indiana, provide continuum of care, recovery, and treatment services. My story is yours. I am a mother. I'm a father, a son, a daughter. I am in recovery from a mental illness, a substance use disorder, with support from family and community. We, we are, are victorious. victorious. Join the voices for recovery. Our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. 
General Dean, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the opioid use disorder prevention resources for communities and for, for the states? I would love to do that. Um, we have been working diligently with our federal partners to make sure that our coalitions have the best evidence-based strategies. Uh, a couple, one example is we work with our friends at NIDA and we build an online course around uh, opioids and it's available on CATCA's website, uh, which is cadca.org, available free. Uh, we constantly have webinars to address medicated assisted treatment, to talk about all of the medicines that are available that the co community should know about. Um, when we do our trainings, uh, we do them twice a year for over 5,000 people. We have a whole track that addresses this issue. So it is critical that we provide the latest evidence-based strategies to all of these community groups so they can address it. And I'm so pleased that we've been able to build online courses. And we actually have a, a URL called Prevention Rx Abuse that you can go on and find a whole host of uh, trainings available for anyone to take. Uh, any citizen in the country can go on to Prevention Rx abuse and find courses they can take on this issue. Excellent. Dr. Bensell, um, I know that you have had some personal uh, experience with this issue. Do you want to share that with our audience? Um, sure. So last year in uh, January 4th, I lost my oldest son, Alex, to an overdose. Um, Alex had graduated from college. He um, was an athlete and um, actually was pursuing his passion of nutrition and exercise or sports medicine. He wanted to become a physical therapist after graduating with a 3.7 in business and political science. He was prescribed OxyContin for two herniated discs back injury and was given short acting and OxyContin and he became addicted. Um, so he went to rehab, he tried very hard to get off, he really didn't want, want to be addicted. Um, when he came home for the Christmas New Year holiday last year, he um, overdosed in my home. A boy had injected him with heroin and he overdosed and um, you know, and this is again, we've done so much in the last year to help all those in need, but you know, Narcan wasn't available. All of the first responders didn't have Narcan. There was 20 people that showed up at the house. Um, I was doing CPR. I had no Narcan. So it, um, I, I think we're making huge strides and um, I'm just so um, thankful for all the hard work and efforts that everyone is doing to try to prevent so many overdoses and or at least prevent deaths from overdoses. I mean we still have a long way to go with some of the other areas but yes thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Johnson so speaking of, of uh, the prevention of overdose um, and the need to continue to work in that area. I know that um, SAMHSA CSAT has uh, uh, some tools for addressing that. Yes, we, uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm kind of emotional from hearing your story. I, um, we, so we have a toolkit, um, the opioid overdose toolkit that is for, that families could use or, or it's really for communities to um, address the issue of opioid overdose and um, has has instructions for how to how to go about doing that. Um, I do also just want to mention um, our our role in try in treatment and in, in improving access to treatment services for people. I mean, one of the one of the um, things that we hear sometimes is that people try to get treatment and they get put on a waiting list or. Um, they don't have it available when they need it, and so we have a number of efforts to, imp to improve access to treatment, um, whatever kind of treatment the patient may want. Um, and we also have some efforts around improving the quality of treatment. Um, so those are just a couple of things I, um, I think are important to remember. It's important to save someone's life, obviously, but then what happens? Then, what so, are you currently doing uh, in terms of helping other families? Are you are you actively working? Sadly, we I, I have many 
friends and moms who have recently lost a child. Um, our, our group is growing and growing, so we meet every Tuesday. My daughter also wants to start a um, fundraiser for Narcan to arm all of the police officers and first responders, because while we're making it more available, not all of them still have them. Um, on their person. So that needs to change. I think they're educating and providing Narcan to the schools. Um, I, I want to make an effort in terms of looking at re after rehab going to the sober living environments because there's no accountability for these homes. They're all over. They're big business. People make money, but there's no accountability. And that's when people use again and relapse. And I, I think we need to somehow get some regulations in place and guidelines if you're going to call your home or place of rental or sober living facility because that tends to fail people once they um, are discharged from rehab. You know, that the, the most important time is once they're discharged from rehab, when they're really in the real world, and that's when our system fails them. Okay, so. thank you. So, Jack, any other research that is going on that the audience might uh, benefit from, from learning in terms of NIDA and, and, and this issue? Uh, th there's, a, there's a lot. And uh, one I, th I didn't get a chance to talk about uh, involves, uh, again, alternatives to uh, pain medication. And there's actually a whole new exciting area that's being developed uh, by some of our researchers looking at uh, non-medications altogether, various types of uh, 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 various types of therapies. In Such particular, as meditation okay, or? Uh, I'll go even more high tech on you here. Uh, the use of, of magnets. As a matter of fact, we've often heard about that, and sometimes that seems a little sci-fi, but there's some exciting research that's being done actually in our laboratories up in Baltimore of the use of, um, of, of magnets to actually uh, uh, change how, in fact, the, uh, the, the brain uh, operates and heals. And so very preliminary, but it's a very exciting area, and it's non-invasive and not even requiring medications. So that's kind of some of the forward thinking that the leadership at NIDA, in particular our director, Dr. Volkov, is really wanting to take the Institute and think big. And uh, I think we can really address uh, this problem as well as the addiction problem in general. Very good. And now we've come to the part of the show which I allow you to give us some final <laughs> thoughts. And I'm going to start with you, Dr. Stein. Final uh, thoughts. Final thought. Um, I'd like to leave you and the uh, uh, the viewers, one, thanking Renee for being here and sharing your personal story. It reminds us of why we do what we do here. And uh, from the NIDA perspective, we like to believe that science really can be a big part of the solution. And for evidence-based prevention, treatment, and recovery approaches uh, to rely on some of the work that comes out of uh, uh, the NIDA-funded research. Uh, the other piece is that uh, there are some major health consequences in, from addiction. HIV, hepatitis C are significant problems related to the opioid problem and again need to be uh, uh, squarely addressed. Very good. Dr. Bensell, final thoughts. Um, first, I just want to thank you for having programs like this. I, I think it's important to um, remove the stigma and judgment that addiction um, many times has. And secondly, um, I also I'm, I guess I'm just very grateful that the awareness of this problem has grown and there's so many people working hard and taking such initiatives. Um, you know, there's so many different programs that are around the country now just to address the issue. So um, thank you again for letting me be a part of this program. Well, thank you for being here. Dr. Johnson. I think um, that for anybody that has a family member or a loved one that um, is dealing with a, an opioid use disorder, I, I just want to leave some hope, I guess, because actually most people do recover. It may take time. Um, it takes good treatment. It takes recovery supports after treatment. That, um, that point in time where you leave a residential program, if that's what people are getting, is critically important. Um, people do need, whether it's safe, sober housing, whether it's um, peer support, whatever it is they need. Um, actually probably lots of different things to help them get through that that first couple years. Um, so, but but th those things can be available and are available in some communities and there is hope. Thank you. General Dean. Well, I thank you again for this opportunity. Uh, we have been uh, labeled in the vineyards now for more than 10 years on this issue. 
we are excited and, and very pleased that, to see that the Senate and the House uh, are passing bills to address this issue. Uh, and uh, the president has talked about adding uh, more than a billion dollars as well. Uh, I guess our only concern and caution is that of all of the excitement around this issue, you have to work the whole continuum. We clearly care about saving lives. It is important that we prevent people from overdosing, but we have to work starting upstream with prevention and work our way through to preventing the overdose. And if we do that, we can in fact change communities. We can take night as science and implement it out in communities, and we can change attitudes, and we can have a very, very positive impact. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I want to remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month, a month in which we celebrate those in recovery, the individuals who provide services for those in recovery, as well as those in need of recovery. And you can get more information so that you can do activities and events throughout the country and all year round, not just in September. You can get it at recoverymonth.gov. So we hope that you go out there and you not only work with your communities, but work with every entity within your community to make them more aware, not only about the opioid uh, uh, problems that exist in our nation and its solutions, but also about what you can do to address them. Thank you for being here. It's been a great show. Thank you very much. To download and watch this program, or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, visit the website at recoverymonth.gov. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of mental and substance use disorders, to highlight the effectiveness of prevention, treatment, and recovery services, and show that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and access other free publications and materials on prevention, recovery, and treatment services, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.